welcome to our editor. <laughs> Woo! Episode thirty-four, baby. I'm Katie. <laughs> I'm Garrett. I also love that this is the lead up to like a very serious. T- <laughs> oh yeah, <it's- laughs> Katie's been um doing creative interpretations of movie themes mm-hmm. this morning, and um then cracks a joke about everybody having a yeast infection right before we go into this very serious, intense topic. To be fair, the yeast infection had nothing to do with the music scores. That's true. They were separate, separate sidetracks. Yeah. (laughs) So it's fine. Don't put that on me. (laughs) I'm not a weirdo. Anyway. About this. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks to all of our new listeners. Uh, Love you. Miss you. Welcome. Um, Yeah. Uh, Follow us on Instagram at the bar's ankle. Hi. We have merch uh, at bit.ly slash ankle high merch. Also known as bit.ly. Also known as bit.ly <laughs> to some. <laughs> uh, links to all that are in our show notes as well as in a, as well as including, I don't know, there's probably a smoother way to say it, but there's also a link in the show notes to our Patreon if you want to join Patreon. Our Patreon's so fun. I do. Like We're gonna it. have an episode. What? That's. I don't know. I'm forgetting the time. It'll already be up by the time this goes up. Uh, yeah, it will have come out the week before this episode airs. Oh, yeah. So we it did will that. have just come out. Yeah, we did that one uh, right before St. Patrick's Day. That was one of my favorites. I think it was really fun. I'm excited yeah. to listen to it because um, it hasn't been edited yet. So I only hear it after. Right. It's been cleaned up a bit. Yes. <laughs> after some of the. Well, we don't really, those don't get edited a ton, so. No, it's all, the yeasty bits are included. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Now you're welcome. <laughs> the gross, the yeasty bits. <laughs> uh. So, uh, yeah, so that's, I think, all of our housekeeping stuff. I think so. Mm, yeah, so... This episode was suggested to us by our Patreon member, Shrimply Pebbles, uh, <laughs> Instagram friend, uh, who I think will be changing their handle soon to a cat's cloco, uh, or whatever the hell. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, I... thanks for the suggestion. This was a disturbing rabbit hole to fall down t- into, but now we're all going together. Oh, here we go. Who's ready to make sure they've taken their meds before we go on this journey? <laughs> yeah, this um, not really any trigger warnings in this one. Um, no, it's more like general systemic doom and gloom than... Yeah, uh, we will have a little bit of a discussion of um, racism and racial bias, but nothing... Um, like nothing really graphic or anything like that. So, and this was also inspired by the medical bias episodes. Yes, yeah, there'll be a, some tie-ins. To, yeah, yeah, what led to this topic being suggested? Um, so I'm talking today about AI and algorithmic bias in medicine. So, doom doom. <laughs> I'm telling you, we need that Law and Order. I want to describe it as like the pipe sound, but. I don't think it's like actually a pipe, but anyway, I'm sorry. Um, no, I don't know that it is. I would. You know what I mean? It's like a tinny, right? Like probably some sort of drum. That sounds like a uh... pipe. It's a pipe-shaped drum. (laughs) It's a rain stick. (laughs) I'm sorry. Yeah, the Law and Order rain stick, famous. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Go ahead. I'll see myself out. We did not record a Dysfunction Junction before this episode, so... Oh, yeah. We're a little bit squiggly. Yeah. Um, that's, that's like you need, like when you shake out the wrinkles out of the laundry. Mm-hmm. That's what the Dysfunction Junction recordings do. We get all the weird out, and then we can record something real. Um, we didn't do that beforehand, so... Yeah. Sorry. Pure, <laughs> unfiltered, concentrate without concentration. Anyway... 
So AI stands for artificial intelligence. It was actually first founded as an academic discipline in 1956. Whoa. I know, right? Yeah, that's real old. Real old. Um, before we got on the moon. So. Oh, yeah. 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 The dictionary definition of AI is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision-making, and translation between languages. According to Wikipedia, AI is intelligence, meaning perceiving, synthesizing, and inferring information, demonstrated by machines rather than demonstrated by animals and humans. AI is used to evaluate data. So like Google will use AI in their predictive text based on what you start typing and what other people who have started that sentence ended up searching for, what type of sources or answers you engage in based on your previous web and search histories and other factors. Netflix, YouTube, Amazon, they all use AI to recommend what you should watch next. Yeah, it's that that tweet that was like, oh, Gmail, if you know what I'm going to say, why don't you write the fucking email for me? You know what? My Microsoft Word is starting to do that and it's <gasps> getting irritating. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, I know. Just the one that I have at home, not the one at work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my at-home license like updates every year. Yeah. Um, the one at work is like, I'm sorry, you want me to do what? Spell check? <laughs> you bought one license 300 years ago and that's what you're stuck with. You better like it. <laughs> no, I can't format that for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. You want to put a picture in? Chaos. Or you get the notification, updates are ready for your computer. Okay, install. Log in as an administrator. Well, yeah, you need administrator approval to update. Which is like anything. four levels of IT above whoever will ever speak to me when I call IT. What gets me is the Adobe licenses. I can't update my Adobe mm -hmm. because I'm not, I don't know, the president of Adobe. Mm -hmm. And it just, I, I can't open things then. Yeah. my want to sign that document? That's too bad. My supervisor had to open a separate ticket to renew my Adobe license so that I could do my basic job function. <laughs> like, edit PDFs. <laughs> Drives me crazy. Anyway. Yeah, anyway, sorry. <clears throat> public sector work is just... It's a dream. It is all unicorns and stars. It and is every episode of Parks and Rec is what it is. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so also uh, the people who live in your phone uh, and the people who live in the box next to your computer, A-L-E-X-A, mm -hmm. just in case anybody's listening to this on speakerphone, I don't oh. want to set off your devices. Anyway, those use AI to understand what you're saying, though. And yeah. <laughs> I hate that information. <laughs> There's nobody more paranoid. I'm very Ron Swanson with this topic. Like anything I no, it make And I it's the same it. thing on your phone when you use like talk to text or oh, anything like that. Yeah. Um and as we discussed before we went on air, we've seen very recently AI creative and generative tools become popular with Chat GPT and AI art. Right. Hate it. Yeah. So anyway, do you want a tinfoil hat before we go yes. further? Okay. I would like that, actually. Elevator music. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> That's your elevator? I was thinking more tinfoil sounds. Oh. Neither is accurate, but that's fine. <laughs> so we, when we become accustomed to technology using AI to complete these tasks for us, like talk to text, we often remove these tasks from the definition of AI – which is, because we're so used to it, which is the phenomenon called AI effect. I also hate that information. Yeah. So anyway, what's an algorithm? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm going to hate it. <laughs> so the definition of an algorithm is a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations, especially by a computer. Um, so it's just a formula. Right. But it's a formula that is self-improving as time goes on. Well, that's... When you combine it with the AI. W yeah, when used with AI. Gotcha, okay. Um, so in this way, artificial intelligence uses algorithms to analyze data and then can allow us to extrapolate data to determine real-world implications 
of medical research and side effects experienced in a lab setting and can also allow us to input some real-world data like socioeconomic status, insurance coverage, regional differences, etc. into that data. Mm -hmm. However, the reality is that AI is more artificial than intelligence and it is best used when applied to, quote, narrow inference tasks where large volumes of data are present and processing power is available to find those associations. So rather than using it as like a global implementation of something, then it's better on these like kind of micro scales. Yes. Sort of like, did you ever see Minority Report? Yeah. 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 Kind of like that. Like the, the criticism of that Mm -hmm. in that movie was that you're monitoring everybody and the idea of like pre-crime being used to prosecute people and convict them. It's like, well, that's not necessarily, like you don't, you can't know that something wasn't going to interrupt the decision making into committing that crime. Right. It's like that the um NYPD guy with the girl meat. What? <laughs> there was that g- <laughs> there was that there's a documentary. The Sarah Lawrence thing? No. There's oh. a documentary about a guy and I think he was an NYPD officer and he wound up getting arrested and charged and they were calling it like a thought crime because he was like seeking out he had like cannibalism ideation i guess okay and was like i don't remember for that he was looking for people to eat or he was just talking to people about looking for people to eat and like the attorney's argument was like but he didn't eat anybody right he was just looking for somebody to eat um because he wound up, like, getting fired and getting arrested. Um, and that was, like, the whole argument of the case was, like, you can't arrest somebody for... Like, he only had... like, planning it but not doing it. Right, like, he only had mens rea. There was no action taken right. on the mens rea. And you need both parts to be... Right. And everybody else was like, yeah, but he's part of the NYPD and he's looking for girl meat. Like, I think he had even purchased the stuff to... capture someone hmm. so we'll there was definitely like that. a we should do that for patreon like where's the line yeah yeah it's a, it's a documentary and i i don't remember i'll have to find it i'll see if my spouse remembers yeah that's interesting because and that's what i thought it was minority report because right it was a, it was a conceptually similar in that he hadn't and it's similar to like girls. conspiracy to commit a crime like Right. With those elements. Planning a terrorist attack versus actually executing a terrorist. And there's like certain things like you have to take, there's like a point of no return. Right. In preparation for the crime where you can still be found, like it's conspiracy to commit murder, not murder. Right. Um, For example. But, I mean, I haven't looked at those laws since law school, so (laughs) I don't need a refresher. I'm not a kidnapping expert. Hmm. Um, Anymore. (laughs) <laughs> and and then I also, with that, I'm like, yeah, but have you done it before and just not been caught? It's kind of the army hammer thing. Yes. Oh, man, that was another rabbit hole that I was, like, way. You were super into I that. was so into that. You were that. so pumped. I just, like, I, it was so shocking. That would be another good Patreon rabbit hole. Yeah. Because they just did, like, a big article on that recently. Mm-hmm. Somebody did. Vanity Fair, maybe? Maybe. Um, I remember seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. But anyway. So tune into Patreon for For some girl meat. Sorry. Don't. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry. Please continue with your minority report uh, comparison. (laughs) And I take back what I said. (laughs) Um, Okay. So when AI has been used uh, in... So it's better with these narrow inference tasks. Right, right, right. Right. Um, Just like Google. Like when you're Googling something. Right. Like you need – it's like sometimes you'll type in something and you're like, that's not what I was looking for. Like – and you go back to your search terms and adjust them. Yes. Um, Meaning that we still need actual humans around to analyze the data, input and outputs. Right. And evaluate how that data 
can be implemented and how it's being used by the AI and whether or not it's actually being used properly by the AI. And it could be that the algorithm that we're using isn't appropriate for the type of output we're looking for. Right. So when you a- are barking up the wrong tree. Right. Yeah. Right track, wrong train. Yep. Um, wrong gravy train. Yes. <laughs> you almost made yourself sick. I saw that. <laughs> um, when AI has been used in the broader economy, concerns have emerged regarding its negative consequences in relation to bias. So, primarily, this bias is seen in racial bias in healthcare algorithms. Cut to the thread that ties us back to our medical bias episodes, episode 29 and 30. So there's two types of racial bias in healthcare algorithms. Explicit use of race to predict outcomes and assess risk, which for obvious reasons, there's been a recent move away from that methodology Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a real obvious form of bias. But as we discussed in episode 30, just because... They're not explicitly saying this patient is black and therefore they won't go to their follow-up appointment doesn't mean that they aren't implicitly thinking that and adjusting the care for that patient based on that preconceived expectation. Right. And And offering them fewer options. Right. Right. Yeah. That's that's the human interface, not the AI interface. Mm -hmm. So. Unless you're teaching the AI. We'll get there. Or AI is learning from. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. (laughs) continue. So <clears throat> when you're but you also end up with this issue where you're if you're using data that inadvertently captures systemic racism although unintentional or at least not consciously intentional that can result in additional inequities. So why do we use these algorithms in healthcare? Hmm, I'm going to say that better. Why do we use <laughs> <laughs> Why do we use these algorithms in healthcare? So, healthcare providers use diagnostic al- algorithms that correct or predict their outputs to individualize risk assessment and guide clinical decisions, which sounds like word soup, right? Yep. Sure does. <laughs> I read it like three times and I was like, please provide an example further down. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> So, for example, in obstetrics, right, yep. vaginal birth after cesarean or VBAC births, mm-hmm. that's an algorithm that predicts the risk of labor and vaginal delivery of a subsequent pregnancy by somebody who has previously delivered a child via cesarean section. Massive disclaimer here. This is not medical recommendation from me or this podcast. Uh, discuss with your own healthcare providers and remember that you are always entitled to a second opinion. Also something we should probably put in every episode. I mean, yeah. <laughs> We're going to end up like sawbones with like the disclaimer. <laughs> um, Get your mystery boil. I'm sorry, but it, like, don't take medical advice from an attorney and a fox doctor. That's yeah, not what we're no here for. No clinical. Silly gooses. Actual real recommendations. That's why we include the sources in our show notes. Yes. Like, do your own research. Ask your own doctors about it. Anyway. Yes. I also feel like, as a non-pregnant person who's never been pregnant, I feel like I always hear that the VBAC recommendations change, like, year to year or doctor to doctor. It, like... Every... Yes. Like, yeah, like, everybody... Women's healthcare, obstetrics, gynecology is the Wild West. There is no standard of care. Everybody has a subjective... That's, like, what we talked about in that medical bias episode where I was, like, I'm going from one practice to another in the same city, in the same field... And had somebody look at me and go, that's not a standard of care I'm familiar with. Right. So, yes, it is true. It, it is way too subjective. Right. So I guess apparently, though, that that's based on, like, an algorithm, <sighs> this recommendation. So, whatever. I mean, I don't know what's worse, an algorithm or an old wives' tale. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so it feels uh, – an algorithm and AI, like, medical decisions feels like the – modern version of an old wives tale kind of yeah. yeah um so 
I wrote down this recommendation, I feel like changes year to year and doctor to doctor. Yeah. But the algorithm that they use also predicts a lower likelihood of success in a VBAC attempted birth for African Americans and Hispanics. From what I could see, there was no explanation. No, I feel like it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. So like we don't invest. We're not spending as much money on them when they're coming in for their Well, I visits. have a little bit of an explanation and you're oh. going to get really mad. Oh, okay, good. So <laughs> vaginal deliveries are generally withheld from non-white women more often or non-white pregnant people more often. Because, which we know because non-white women continue to have higher rates of C-sections than white women. And from what I could tell, there's no biological explanation for why a black pregnant person right. is prone to a breech delivery or, you yeah, know, right. like prone to needing no. a C-section. Right. Like everybody uh, is pretty much built the same. Right. Yeah. So, like, right. Like the plumbing is the same. So there's no reason for, yeah. Right. And so, <clears throat> so then with a second pregnant pregnancy, you have more patients with their second pregnancy. Automatically getting a cesarean because they'll deny them a vaginal birth. Right. Because they've already had a cesarean. So right. more often than not in a second pregnancy, a white woman will have already delivered vaginally versus her black or hispanic counterparts right who have more often than not had a society as more well more often than their white counterparts have yes. had cesareans at a higher rate have been right delivering via cesarean right so then it skews the data so that right. for the VBAC algorithm it's going to say well you have to and because it's safer when all because of that's the my understanding is VBAC is not safe so that's once yeah. you have a c-section you have to have another c-section pretty much that was my understanding as right. well. And I think, um, but then again, it goes back and like, forth. Wow. Yeah. So it, it like, I don't know, it's this whole thing. And that's how everything, as a pregnant person, everything I research is, uh, everything seems subjective all I the time. I feel like that's why you have to find providers that you personally click with. Yeah. So that you can just say, like, I'm just going to do what you tell me to do. Like, yeah. I have to trust you. That's my birth plan. Um, I want to go into the hospital, have a child, and I want both of us to leave alive and in one piece. At the same time, ideally. At the same time. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it. That's my whole, uh, to not leave with a significant amount of physical and mental trauma. That's my, that's the goal. That's it. That's no bold. Plan. Bold ass. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That is so progressive. <laughs> There's no, no, no. How plan. could you say something so brave yet so true? <laughs> it's almost like you didn't plan this at all. Nope. <laughs> nope. There's no goal aside from being alive and not scarred well, emotionally. I was going to say, you might end up with <laughs> actual scars. I also really preferably would like to leave with a B-hole. That's also on the list. Separate from your V-hole. Separate. I want two separate holes. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> <laughs> Can you add orifices for me, please? <laughs> I want to keep them guessing, you know? I got to get it spicy. <laughs> been, been together for 10 years. <laughs> That's so horrific. <laughs> so horrific. Oh, my God. She's so happy with herself. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. In, like, five years, when we're still doing this podcast somehow... And I'm having a kid, mm -hmm. you'll be able to horrify me. So tell you all about the pooping and the, the ice holes. diapers. Yeah. Um all the extra holes. Like an iPhone. Yeah. Well, iPhone has lost holes over time. That's true. Yeah, they've closed up. Like an old iPhone. Like an old uh, ear piercing. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets worse. We're cursed. We are. Sorry. Uh so anyway. Sorry, like I said, the the algorithm for VBAC deliveries mm -hmm. ends up using skewed data because the starting point is the, input the result is right. of implicit bias. or And that could also be the result of these systemic issues in healthcare where people right. from lower socioeconomic statuses are going to these hospitals that are 
completely overcrowded. Their doctors are overworked. And for better or worse, the doctor is just trying to get the baby out alive before a shift change as and you have to as possible. Right. Like you have to update new staff on what's going on. Right. And it can just you can look at this thing and say, we don't have the the resources to allow you to labor naturally for 39 hours before you deliver. Right. So we have to, you know, they're looking at it from an economic perspective. The hospital's right. looking at it from, well, if we turn this over and get this room clean. In a more predictable fashion. Right. You know, if we can have her definitely in and out in 36 hours versus maybe 48 or 72, if we're letting her labor naturally and then, you know, have a day to recover, you know, all the extra time they give you in the hospital after you've had this major medical event, the whopping six hours you spend in a hospital after before they send you home and then you don't see anybody for six weeks. Right. I'm sorry. And, anyway. <laughs> well, you're right, though. And there's, I mean, there's plenty of studies about the, the benefit of a, a ba- to a baby of having a vaginal delivery. Right. And, like, the vaginal, um, the birth canal, like, flora that the baby can get. And right. And they need less suctioning a lot of times because it gets all, like, squeezed out of them like a packet of ketchup, I guess. I don't know. Like toothpaste. Yeah. And uh, that's less graphic than my version. Yep. Less <laughs> farting, also. <laughs> also less red. So that was an example of yes. healthcare ag- algorithmic bias. Right. Because it definitely is like a chicken and egg situation. Exactly. Am I having this VBAC or am I, am I being denied a VBAC because it's really not safer for me or because the computer told my provider who is racist that it's unsafe for me to do it? Well, even if your provider's not racist, if... Not conscious. If it's actually not safe... Mm -hmm. fine but if you were denied the opportunity for a vaginal birth in the first place yep then it's like you just lose that element of control over your you know you lose that autonomy you're eliminated a major medical decision not to mention it is i've watched an animation of what a c-section is do you know how many layers there are to your stomach there's a lot it's nuts and Plus you're cutting through like muscle and you're taking organs out the and most shoving them horrifying part of it was that they, like, make this incision, and God forbid they just make it a little bit wider. No, they make their little 10-centimeter incision, which, by the way, folks, is mm, less than five inches. So it's, like, the size of a mm, conservative bagel, really. A Cheerio. (laughs) (laughs) It's Cheerio size, right? (laughs) And then they use these, like, metal scoopies to rip it apart and, like, stretch. And I just think, like, just give your – if you need more space, take more space. Right. Like, just – what? Why are you ripping at me? Right. It's kind of like I read about one woman who had an episiotomy. There was no consent. They just went in and – like, what? And I've heard recently that you actually heal better if they don't cut. Yes. And then – stitch you up afterwards if you need stitches right and they cut you like any which way with an episiotomy what i just i can't there's just yeah no it's it's um save my screams for another point in the day where i'm just (sighs) mad about everything oh our little mini so that we're recording later will get you screeching oh good let me tell you i was hyped (laughs) Garrett's maternity leave is going to be lit, guys. <laughs> it's gonna be... There's going to be so much screaming. Garrett's going to be screaming. The baby's going to be screaming. <laughs> K- Katie's going to be screaming. <laughs> Donkey! <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so a 2019 study of healthcare algorithms found that black patients who are considerably sicker than their white counterparts are given the same risk score. And that risk score, that risk score is used to determine whether uh, the patient should be admitted or if they're told to follow up with their PCP um, and also then what their course of care looks like. Right, like so, what treatment options are they even being offered? Right. Because so, the computer is telling them to offer. Mm. This algorithm in particular evaluated... Uh, or the algorithm that was evaluated in that study, assigned risk scores based on past healthcare spending. Yes. 
So I did read about that and was, again, chicken and egg. Right. And based on that, it found that black patients in general have lower health care spending than white patients for a given level of health. So I'm going to refer you again back to episode 30 and our discussion on racial medical bias. The study blamed, the study that I'm talking about today, blamed this disparity in healthcare spending on existing racial disparities in the system. So again, if you're in an area that doesn't have as many options for your healthcare providers, if you don't have comprehensive health insurance, if you're in the U.S., um, if... A lot of people. Right. If your health insurance is cost prohibitive, even if you have it, if you have a stupid high deductible, then it's automatically going to temper your spending. Right. So whether, regardless of your race, like I know people who are white who have extremely high deductible plans and they just forego treatment that they would probably really benefit from. It's working exactly the way they wanted it to. (laughs) Exactly. So... Yeah, episode 30 for that discussion and more in-depth and also um, the episode notes for episode 29 have all the sources for episode 30 that include that racial bias in healthcare stuff. So this study from 2019 also noted that the risk level that would result in the automatic identification for the care management team showed black patients had 26.3% more chronic illnesses than white patients. Yet, if the bias was eliminated from the algorithm, if the healthcare spending part was eliminated from the algorithm, the percentage of black patients that automatically would have been enrolled in the care management program would rise from 17.7% to 46.5%. More than double. 30% difference. Mm -hmm. Mm. It was huge. I couldn't... I was like, "That, that is... Like, not negligible, even a little bit. No. So, yeah, no, it was wild. And the algorithmic bias was also found to account for 4.7 times more racial disparities in pain relative to standard measures of severity graded by doctors. Meaning, having a human interface of a healthcare provider who has been adequately trained out of their racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, sexual orientation, or religious biases that they're getting while they're in medical school if they don't have it going in. But that's a critical part of Mm. using these algorithms effectively. So, and also these algorithms are used all the time to help predict healthcare costs so that these hospitals can estimate what they need to be bringing in, what they are spending, what they will spend the next year, all that stuff. And there's been, like, a huge – like, my spouse has a uh, Six Sigma certification, which is, like, operational efficiency. Um, And there's been a huge influx of people with that Six Sigma going into healthcare and hospitals hiring them and insurance companies hiring them so they can cut costs. Like, hey, you guys are already cutting corners on everybody's treatment all the time. Do we really need you to, like – tell everybody how to be more efficient well more that's the, lean yeah and that's the thing like don't get me wrong i think that there are many processes in administration for sure that can be more efficient just like with anything else right exactly but when you're the the some things are not about efficiency like education you're doing a capitalism about it and like you can't like the the problem that we're having in america because we are a shithole country we are the shithole country um is that our healthcare is a capitalist system it's not socialized healthcare we don't have single payer healthcare and they're doing the same thing with education education is turning into a capitalist structure yes so yeah and it's just it's the like well Basically, if you want better health care, why don't you stop being so poor? Oh. It's like Mish- Mr. Fish Odor from Bob's Burgers, yes. but not at all charming or cute. And, and not Kevin Klein, And not ironic. Yes. Just reality. Yes. It is Mr. Fish Odor. You're right. That's a good, that's a good comparison. Yeah. Eye patch and everything. <laughs> yeah. White suit. <laughs> um, can you tell I've been doing a rewatch of Bob's Burgers because <laughs> it's every reference I have? <laughs> She also uh, left her keyboard downstairs when she got here. I did, yeah. (laughs) But don't worry, we still have Garrett for the fart noises. Yep. 
<laughs> anyway. We'll pretend they're fake. <laughs> that was a real one. <laughs> um so yeah, like we said in our in episode 30, like it's it's not just as simple as oh, okay, well, black and hispanic patients or black patients only refuse procedures that are offered to them as we previously discussed uh because of these systemic racial biases the black patients aren't even offered treatments that could be more effective they're not offered mastectomies at the same rate as white patients with breast cancer they're not offered um cardiac treatments for knots. yeah for types of uh i think it was like an arrhythmia thing mm-hmm. um they're just not offered those treatments, so their healthcare costs will be different. So you're not even comparing the same you're, – you're not comparing the groups properly. Right. You aren't um, – you kind of have to, like, parse out the differences mm-hmm. and not include those at all. In, like, you have to take, okay, this patient with this exact medical history – and this patient, you know, patient B with the same exact medical history and the same course of treatment, mm-hmm. like only use those things. And then again, you end up with like, well, then how can we use it to predict costs and like outcomes and this, that and the other? Because no patient is really identical. Like you said, again, with your infertility thing, like everybody's different. Right. So that's why you need that human interface. And um, that's why I, you need uh, not super racist human interface yeah (laughs) um so also regarding bias between the sexes (laughs) um so there's a couple this one was interesting because my research showed that there were desirable biases when it came to the differences between the sex when it and in implementing algorithms I disagree. So hear me out. (laughs) A desirable bias includes taking into account sex and gender differences to make precise diagnosis, diagnoses, and recommend tailored and more effective treatment for each individual. This represents a much more accurate approach than collapsing all sex and gender categories into one uh, and such as data generated from mixed sex or mixed gender cohorts. So, like we discussed, how medicine and pharmaceuticals don't account for how those drugs will interact with female hormones. Right. Like, separating those groups is actually necessary to accurately predict the outcomes. Right, but do they? (laughs) Well... So it's that thing of like an almost like an overcorrection. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. Like, well, we can't, we can't mix. We can't make it good. So we're just going to make it God worse. forbid we can't mix the races. Oh my God. But we can mix the sexes just fine. So it's kind of like there's also the undesirable bias that comes up as unintended or unnecessary sex and gender discrimination. And occurs when claims are made in relation to sex or gender in medical conditions despite the lack of exhaustive evidence to support them or based on skewed evidence. For example, epidemiological studies indicate there is a higher prevalence of depression among women. However, this may result from a skewed diagnosis due to clinical scales of depression measuring symptoms that occur more frequently among women. So another source of undesirable bias is the misrepresentation of the target population, leaving minorities out. Another example is, of course, excluding pregnant and nursing people from psychiatric research. And everything. Well, yes. Nothing. You can't even ride a roller coaster anymore. What is the world coming is, to? Can I take this medication? No. We, we don't actually know. We're just telling you no. Because nobody will test it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, roller coaster. which I didn't realize on the depression scale, like how they measure that and whether, I didn't realize that, I guess, depression shows up differently for men. Oh, like the representation is different? Yeah. No, I didn't know that either. 
Um, but also I feel like if you're looking at, if you're asking me like in the last four weeks, have you had feelings of this? If my period was a week ago, yeah, I could have felt hopeless or more tired than usual or so yeah i feel like oh i cried listening to like a a listener story for sinisterhood this morning yeah (laughs) it's so random i was like oh boy (laughs) ovulating (laughs) huh is the date (laughs) i just think that (laughs) oh my god his mom loved him (laughs) so stupid touching story but i was like it is 8 a.m lady like what am i doing <laughs> yeah exactly what is happening <laughs> um no but you're right and so it was just one of those things where i was like huh although we haven't actually done an episode on depression i was yet. literally just gonna say to you maybe we should do a, an episode on depression because now i'm interested like what the differences are oh now you're interested that's nice garrett yeah. Jeez, not that let me put it this way i'm interested to see the information (laughs) am i going to have more sympathy for men never (laughs) let's give that disclaimer right now (laughs) no offense man just kidding offense all the offense all right well as garrett taught us in her hormone episodes and is teaching you right now in her hormone episode (laughs) (laughs) what pregnancy hormones Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so there's extremely relevant differences between the sexes and how we're treated in the pharmacodynamics uh, world. So pharmacodynamics, if you don't know, is a single word, which is ridiculous because yep. there's like a trillion letters. Too many letters. <laughs> but it's the study of how different chemicals interact with one another in the human body. So it's it measures or it studies how different drugs interact with each other, but also how those drugs interact with your own biological makeup and that's how we get to that point where they're like we can't possibly throw estrogen into this test like god forbid (laughs) so um i wrote i.e how hormones and other meds you're on mix together to make a cursed or hashtag blessed cocktail in your system (laughs) usually cursed yeah um and then when you ask about side effects they're like yeah duh yeah, well, didn't you do all of your own research on this medication? We gave you the forty-five you page insert that is written in point three. Didn't font. you read the fine print? Yeah, on newsprint that's translucent, so don't read it in a. Uh, a you hit sunny the agree place. on. T- <laughs> yeah, you hit the agree on terms and conditions. You said you didn't so. have any questions for the pharmacist. So what do you want me to do? What? I can't answer questions. You can't have questions you now, <laughs> dummy. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's how I feel most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, pharmacodynamics, as I said, it furthers proving that the design of preclinical and clinical studies really, 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 really needs to have sex and gender-based striations in them to reduce the time it takes to translate adverse effects reported by patients after FDA approval. Right. Um, also, yeah, on the FDA too, like what the fuck are you doing? Well, and it's women way more often will report adverse side effects after FDA approval and something hits the market because women are not usually included in the clinical trials, let alone preclinical trials. Trials And something I read also said that in lab settings, they're still using mostly male mice. They don't even like <laughs> split that up, which I feel like is the most basic. Yeah, it's so fucking random. Like just you have is mice. And I bet you there are so many men that are like, oh. That's female privilege. They don't test on you. Well, yeah, but those guys also have to jerk off because no women will date them. But it's uh-huh. all because we're, what is the word they use? I don't know. Their slang is so bizarre, the incels. What slang? What slang? I wonder how many incels listen to our podcast. Probably None. a... <laughs> yeah. No, we're probably big in the incel world. We're too triggering for <laughs> incels for them to listen. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Again. <laughs> As I look at my spit dribbled all over myself from earlier. Yeah, we're both uh, doing really well. Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, so it is for this reason, fair data generation and explainable algorithms are fundamental to the design and application of AI in healthcare settings to optimize health and well-being across the sex and gender spectrum. <clears throat> 
This is also important. Here's a real world example, heart attacks. Men experience when having a heart attack, nausea or vomiting, jaw, neck, or back pain, squeezing chest pressure or pain, and shortness of breath. Women, when they're having a heart attack, can experience nausea or vomiting, jaw, neck, or upper back pain specifically, chest pain sometimes, but not always, pain or pressure in their lower chest or upper abdomen, shortness of breath, fainting, indigestion, and extreme fatigue, which are so like, and the, there was that thing where they were like, oh, it feels like a period cramp where it's like, well, thank you for putting it in terms that I can understand. As far as like intensity goes, but also those Location. are really vague symptoms. Not vague, but like. Well, I mean, like upper abdomen things. pain. Like I'm going to think that I just ate too much or indigestion. I could, I would think that was my ulcer acting up. Mm hmm. Maybe I've had a heart attack and I don't know. Maybe. I'm not going to say that out loud. I'm sorry. Keep going. <laughs> you have a blood pressure cuff downstairs. You can. You'll be fine. Just check it. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So, it, it's, you know, those differences are, you know, that, that like, the difference in heart attacks is something that I know of because of that Go Red for Women campaign that they do every February. But there's, I'm sure, plenty of other conditions yep. that manifest differently between the sexes. And part of that is also, you know, um, societal and based on how men and women are, quote unquote, allowed to express discomfort. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, like upper back pain, I always have upper back pain. I have huge boobs. Like, yeah, like, I mean, I was just thinking if I had nausea, vomiting and like upper abdominal pain, I would think hey, I had Pepto-Bismol. Yeah. I would think <laughs> I had like a stomach bug. Yeah. Especially if it was just like a rapid onset, I would never, th and fatigue. Yeah, I'm sick. Mm -hmm. That's what's wrong with me. I have a stomach bug. And I'm surprised because I know that left arm pain is also, or left arm numbness mm -hmm. is a symptom of a heart attack, um, but it wasn't listed on the... Yeah, like I thought upper arm pain was like, mm -hmm. but I thought that was more men than women. I don't know. Yeah. But again, I feel like, am I relaying actual information or old wives tales? Don't know. No one knows. Or is well, AI telling me what to think? We're not doctors, so it doesn't matter. That's true. Good point. <laughs> Kind of like our bear attack tips. Yeah, which PK appreciated. Now he knows how to survive a bear attack. But you I laughed so hard at that. Don't give him your kid. He's going to feed it to a bear. That's true. <laughs> He'd be like, hello, Mr. Bear. I'm a human. This is a smaller, tastier human. I need to go. This one's like veal. <laughs> right? You know, Fresh. am I right? Fresh. <laughs> Runs away. Doesn't run. Slowly walks away. <laughs> Right. So he doesn't get chased. With arms waving. <laughs> Introducing yourself is just... That one. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so because the AI computers can only use the information provided to it, the concern is not only that the AI is just reflecting our biases back to us, but that AI is doing so on a massive scale without oversight, creating a situation called algorithmic bias. Mm -hmm. So I read an article in the Journal of Global Health called um, Artificial Intelligence and Algorithmic Bias, Implications for Health Systems, and that article highlighted three challenges that health systems will face in addressing algorithmic bias. First, lack of a clear standard of fairness. Um, so algorithms are trained on data from the world as it currently exists. Mm -hmm. So... For this article gave an example of basically doing a Google search. They didn't use Google. But if you do a Google search for images of CEO, that showed 11% of results were female. However, at the time the search was used, 20% of CEOs in the U.S. were women. So that raises the question of whether the algorithm is biased or was it just reflecting the available data? Um, I hate it. Yeah. So that showed that the algorithms needed additional stewardship, but because there's not a universally recognized quantitative summary metric for fairness, quote unquote, the evaluation is ultimately qualitative and therefore at the mercy of the implicit biases of the evaluators. 
<clears throat> so just as a reminder, implicit bias is a form of bias that occurs automatically and unintentionally, but never the, nevertheless affects judgment, decisions, and behavior. So the second type of challenge affecting algorithmic bias is the lack of contextual specificity. So health systems and needs vary in design objectives and critically in the diversity of the groups they serve from different cultures and environments with different socioeconomic profiles, lifestyles, preferences, and genetic endowments. Thus, a quote, generally applicable AI model should be developed based on data that reflects the diversity of the place where it will be used. Right. But data from those groups is not necessarily available oh my God. based on the aforementioned racial bias and systemic racism. Yes. So certain groups are not sampled at all or are only sampled in a specific context leading to skewed data. For example, oftentimes politicians will point to the high crime areas in inner cities as proof that police are needed but don't acknowledge that those areas are predominantly inhabited by black and brown bodies and are subject to increased patrols by police that suburban and rural areas simply don't have. Like, I grew up in the suburbs, and the only time I saw a police car on my street was when somebody's son was visiting them, and the son was a cop. <laughs> oh, I was like, <laughs> yeah, because men are causing problems. No. No. I, no. I see what you're saying. Yep. That the, too. the police officer was visiting his mom. <laughs> Um, yep, yep, yep. We did not have neighborhood patrols, though. Like, the cops weren't just, like, doing rounds. Yeah. Um, My area was uh, poorer, so yes. Right. So was. if you have constant surveillance, yeah. though, you... Right, like, by nature of them snooping around and bending rules, they're going to find... Well, they're going lottery. to see... Like, yeah, they're going to see more instances of truancy or graffiti and or vandalism. And also, like, it's, again, a self-fulfilling prophecy because... Exactly. I mean, then you'll see somebody who's getting pulled over because the police officer thinks that they're just a fuck. Right. There's a Cut to. Phrase I'm looking for that's not coming to me. And then they wind up with a resisting arrest charge, and that's their charge. You're like, right. so why did you stop them, and why were you having an interaction in the first place? Right. So anyway. But compared to the fucking Murdoch family. I can't, don't even get me. Woo! Don't even get me started. So like, Somebody take New Buster down. They were obviously not behaving ever. Right. But they were never subjected to increased surveillance. Correct. So um, it's just that thing it's of... Bullshit. Yes. It's talking points and bullshit. Yes. And scared white people that like punitive measures for other people because it makes them feel better. Right. So... That's why the lack of contextual specificity, like to say, oh, the the crime rate in upstate New York is so much higher than it used to be. Well, the population is higher, number one. Number two, you're packing more people into the major cities in upstate New York. So because those areas have more police patrols, you're going to have an uptick in crime. Right. Or like, there's fewer jobs available because the economy's bad, which means right. So then desperate you desperate times, desperate measures. So you like, need that context, right, to either adjust the algorithm itself, right, or have that human interface after the fact to say, like, to kick out the um, more extraneous the skewing data. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Like, none of these large scale issues, like we were talking about, how it needs to be. You need to have, like, you need to ask Google a pointed question in order to get the information you're looking for. Um, you can't give simplistic, like, um, solutions to large-scale complex problems. Right. So, no, and it's so just not, like, an increase in crime. Like, there's a thousand reasons why there's an increase in crime. And is there really an increase in crime? Or is there, like, a tiny increase in crime? Is it even an increase? Is it right. just like like we know crime goes up in the summer, right? Like, how are you skewing the data to make it work for your narrative, right? Just like how is the data getting skewed with AI because you're giving it bad input, right? So, the third way that um, the third challenge facing health systems uh, trying to address algorithmic bias 
is, quote, they called it the black box nature of deep learning. I hate that. I hate that whole thing. Deep learning involves the transformation of data from the real world, such as pixels from an x-ray, into multiple layers of numbers that are combined to create the output of a diagnostic category. So in this example, like the computer is reading the x-ray to tell you if there's a fracture rather than like a radiologist telling you, which is wild. Why do you look so afraid? <laughs> oh, I hate it. <laughs> like, there's just some things I'm like, can't we? I And I feel it makes me feel like such a boomer that I'm like, I want to talk to a person. But like, seriously, can I just have like a human with eyeballs looking at my x-ray instead of the Jetsons? Mm-hmm. I mean, unless that oh. computer is also just going to be like, burp, 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 and then heal the bone instantly. Correct. Ruffling input, frankly, from the computer. Yes. Like, shut the fuck up and take the picture. Nobody my asked guy. you. Yeah. Take the picture and give it to a human with eyeballs. <laughs> really ableist, but whatever. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> just real mad about this topic. <laughs> so in practice, there are up to 100 layers of numbers and the relative influence of different elements in each layer is established within the process of learning. At this point in time, we don't know how to measure the learning curve of an AI system. And therefore, data scientists, clinicians, and patients can't know exactly how the algorithm produced a particular outcome or prediction. Yeah. I mean, there's times where, like, I think it's a good thing, like, so they're starting to use AI with, like, farming, where they can – it like, the AI, the machines are planting the crops. They have, like, a geotag assigned to each plant so they know, like, that plant's history and know exactly how to treat an issue exactly as it comes up. And that's a type of efficiency that I think is great. Looking at my x-ray and having it, like, beep boop and tell me if my arm is broken, not a fan of. Mm. And then being like, well, we don't actually know at this point if it's just that the machine's really smart or it, it's I I'm sorry. Keep going. No, I mean, I agree. I think there's going to circle the drain with us that I, there's the thing of like, you know, at what point are we taking out the the human element of humanity and right. the, the human experience. Like, like some things shouldn't be computer driven. Right. Healthcare, just like it shouldn't be driven by capitalism, should not be computer driven. Like some things just need humans. Like, do I think that it should play a role? Like maybe there's a, a diagnosis that they wouldn't have otherwise considered. Sure. But is it ever really working to somebody's benefit like that? Probably not. Yeah. It's probably more we, focused on cutting costs than anything yeah, else. Yeah, I think we see this a lot in, like, probably medical coding. Right. And how they will, like, so, okay, you go in to the ER and you're explaining to the triage nurse, like, what your problem is. Mm -hmm. They'll put in the code. You're explaining it to, like, a normal person. Like, oh, I fell and now I can't, like, move my wrist, really. I can't make a fist. Right. Um, so I, I need help. <laughs> Hit me. So they'll put in a code that's like, you know, slip and fall, wrist pain, you know, left arm, blah, blah, blah. They put in that code. But they're interpreting what you're saying. There's that human interface right. before that data goes into the computer. Who then may be looking at a diagnosis and being like, oh, something. Nope, that's not accurate. Right. That definitely can't be it. So, um, and then, you know, when you have patients that come in who might have like, needs from the psych department and they have they might have like a, a physical injury oh i slipped and fell and da 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 it's like well so why is that guy climbing the wall right well it's like yeah. well that doesn't exactly explain the type of injury you have like mm -hmm. you slipped and fell and you know landed on your hand but why is your why do you have a head laceration and right you know that's where clinicians and the human part comes in with having a human nurse or doctor right there to ask those questions and piece right. together the information that the computer can't see or the or computer if isn't like being told telling you in a very subtle way that they're not safe at home like mm -hmm. the it, all i can picture is going to the er and having it be like when you're ordering something at mcdonald's with one of those machines and yeah. it's like do you want a large or a small and you're like i'm not safe at home and it's like do you want a large or a small? 
press zero or say operator. Yes. <laughs> and then you say operator and it's like, do you want a large or a small? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just the possum screaming into the phone meme. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. So possible remedies for algorithmic bias. Going off grid. Delete Ron Swanson. <laughs> yeah, throw your typewriter in the dumpster. Yes. Um, <laughs> establish the context in which algorithms will be developed and deployed. So if bias is present in the world, it's going to show up in the data and will be learned by the machine you give the data to. Hiding or protecting certain variables from the algorithm will not eliminate algorithmic bias because the data will still reflect the bias of the researchers. Mm-hmm. Thus, in the context of health systems, the programmers need to, quote, be explicitly aware of the specificities of the health system context for which they are developing the algorithms by considering differential needs of different groups, which is best achieved by multidisciplinary data science teams and by regulating and evaluating the algorithms periodically. So like, right. don't like just like set it and forget it. Yeah. Right. So uh, to establish a process to counter the risks of bias and algorithm development, one suggestion is that these symptoms use a, quote, human in the loop system, where a human decision maker reviews the algorithmic outputs to allow the human to make that final decision. And I wrote, here's hoping that the human they choose has been trained in, to evaluate biases in healthcare. Right. Uh, I mean. I would hope. Uh, but yeah. The fact that the article didn't say it, I was like, uh-oh. Oh, so we're just all silently acknowledging that. Yeah, I'm like, you, I feel like we need to be more explicit. Yes. But anyway, uh, if we can train developers and data scientists to both recognize and consider bias, that will help reduce bias and algorithm development. And the peer review process can be helpful, but that requires that the algorithm get published in a peer-reviewed journal. And, and everything becomes proprietary in a capitalist society. So, Well, not even that, but the speed of development like we're developing them too fast to publish them and allow them time to be peer reviewed let alone like any kind of governmental regulation because that's a good 30 years behind the technology um well don't worry because we i come back to that oh, so okay cool um the third way to counteract algorithmic bias bias is balanced development of the discipline of health data science Developing an AI algorithm in the science in the health sciences requires engineers, statisticians, and healthcare providers, which is like so much brain power I can't even fathom. Like, yeah, I would feel like I had the IQ of a Q-tip in that room. Yeah. Like, and also all I can think is like, and this is just me being really cynical, is cool. you get a bunch of like dudes in that room because you know they would just end up being a bunch of dudes who then just are having a pissing match over who's smarter. That's how I see that going. I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's me being cynical. It's definitely you being cynical. I think that there are far more women in STEM these days. Yeah. Particularly in as a healthcare provider and Love engineer. It. I don't yeah. know necessarily about statisticians, but you definitely see them more. I definitely see them more in engineering and um, healthcare roles. Yeah. Um, that's true. And like, to, so. I mean, I also wonder sometimes if I'm projecting because I yes. uh, refuse to see men. So male I'm, provider, no thank you. The only male provider I have is my GP, mm-hmm. who I'm, like, fascinated by. He's one yeah. of the best people I've ever met. Yeah. But um, I've seen a male gynecologist before for one of my culpos. Mm-hmm. That's the only time a man I wasn't dating was between my legs. Fair. So. No, I've had a couple male gynecologists because I used to try and tell myself, like, there's no difference. Don't be judgmental. <laughs> Ah, I've heard There's a difference. people in our parents' age bracket basically say things like um, they would avoid female physicians because they believed that they had less training, which could yes. have been true because they were edged out right. of training opportunities. Like, right, like boxed out of any. Right. So then it was like – Again, that self-perpetuating bullshit mm-hmm. because it's like, well, I can't get the training if you don't allow me to get right. The training. Right. And then – so all I'm doing is like practicing sutures on grapefruit or whatever. Yeah. And it's like that's 
some madness. But anyway, um, yeah, no, it's I've heard that more than once. And I just think I refuse to believe it. Like I We're definitely past that now. I think so. Because you've got more women going into like law and medicine than men. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, suck it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Eat my farts. <laughs> but that's what Bart Simpson says, right? Yeah, I think so. Shorts. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> Uh, I do have potato, a tomato. <laughs> I do have a um, little rabbit hole that I fell down. Actually, cool. we could probably do like a brief Patreon on it, but it talks about men and it'll make you more cynical. About Perfect. Them. Yeah, just what we need, right? Fuel on this fire. Our Patreons will love it. Yeah, our Patronuses will be big fans. Probably. Yeah. Um. Okay, so <laughs> it requires. Uh, engineers, statistici- statisticians, and healthcare providers. These professions have all have known problems with gender and racial diversity, at least in the U.S., but definitely also in other countries as well. Um, the study I was reading suggests developing a data scientist oath that enshrines Ooh. a specific commitment to addressing algorithmic bias. Yeah, that's excellent. I like that. Yeah, and very specific to that career i guess yeah and like something that is going to be a growing problem in the future Mm -hmm. and so then oh sorry (laughs) that came out of nowhere so then creating teams that develop these ai programs who are diverse and from diverse backgrounds will help with this but in my opinion as demonstrated by the research i did in the medical bias episodes even minorities can be taught to be biased yeah so um it really like not to be all Reaganomics about it, but, like, you have to start at the top yeah. and fix that situation so that those people aren't training the new people with their own biases. Right, because that's definitely happening. Yeah. Um, and and I think what was really mind-blowing to me, like, when we were reading some of these articles that our um, friend of the pod sent was, you know, you think about the conversations that have been happening in the last few years about, like, dealing with things on a systemic level – How do you deal with it on a systemic level when you constantly have AI feeding it? So, like, even if you think you're fixing it, yeah, AI is like doing all this background work to just fuck it up more. And it's it's right, and that's like the minority report thing. Like, you have to almost like you have to just completely power down that system. Yeah, reboot. Right, like set up your stats differently and then turn it on. Like you, because it's currently just reflecting our biases and our problems back to us, and. I feel like the United States could use a hard reset at this point. Well, we depending on to, which politician you talk to. <laughs> we do need to turn it off and turn it back on again. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. Or just hit us on the side really hard with like yeah. a flat hand or a baseball bat. Yeah. Yeah. And then reboot us. Yeah. Or turn us off. Give us three minutes to cool down and then turn us back on. <laughs> Take out our cartridge and blow on us really hard. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, one of those blowjobs mm-hmm. to fix it. Yeah. Just a reset blowjob. Yep. Everybody knows that those work. (laughs) Our parents are going to love this episode. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, (laughs) the fourth way to... um, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was three. (laughs) No, I have two more. (laughs) Oh, no. I'm sorry. The fourth fourth way is transparency and explainability in algorithm development. So this is about making the inner workings of the deep learning aspects, the black box part of the algorithm, um, particularly the AI's parameters, inputs, and outputs, and counterfactuals um, available so that clinicians and policymakers know which information is even being used. Right, which we're way too capitalist for that. So that they can make a decision as to whether the AI-directed outcome is reasonable or not based on the factors considered by the algorithm and the purpose for the output. Right. And then finally, public sector involvement. And I think that this is ultimately what would actually solve the problem and also what will never be done. (laughs) Right. Because, I mean, how many different things, like, you have to force regulation in order for anything to be safe for people. Yeah. So the public, this study said that the public sector must be involved in development and impl- implementation of AI in health in the healthcare space 
because the public sector is better able to establish standards of fairness and they can provide the largest data sets possible, which would provide AI with the diversity necessary to overcome the implicit biases. However, private sector companies need to be willing to share their AI technology with the public sector in order to create that symbiotic relationship. So I'm doubtful. Yeah, LOL. Like, ne- never in a million. The end. That's all yeah. I have. <laughs> the end. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it definitely, like, you just look at the number of things that companies are like, I'm, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Free market. I, oh. Adam Smith can suck every last D. Who's Adam Smith? Uh, that's the one who developed that invisible hand of the market theory. And oh, works. you know what? I confused him with Adam Schiff, and I was like, don't we like that one? <laughs> No. Fun fact about Adam Schiff, his wife is named Eve. Excellent. Yeah. I hope they only wore Cute, fig right? leaves to their wedding. Well, um, I didn't Google that in my random Googling. It was a missed show. opportunity if they didn't. That's true. Or just at least their wedding cake toppers were just nude Adam and Eve. Or um, if they had a snake officiate yeah, wedding. Well, or a snake would be like wrapping around the tiers of the wedding cake and they're sitting on top of an apple naked. With a fig leaf. So what you're saying is you just, you're just hoping there was a lot of nudity at the wedding. <laughs> She's like, no. Make your guests as Maybe. uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> Everybody knows that's the best way to have a good wedding. <laughs> uh, lots of nudity and lots of eye contact. <laughs> well, that was excellent and uh, disheartening and upsetting. Yes. Oh, good job. Yeah. It was. Um, no, I was constantly derailing it. <laughs> you did your best. I did. And that's what matters in the words of the Grinch. We did our worst, and that's what matters. Me every time you're doing the research on an episode. It's true. I'm just the WB frog. Just Although I was fully crazy back. for PCOS, so we're even. Yeah. 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 You didn't sing. That's a good point. <laughs> that is a good point. I didn't even bust out that song from Monsters, Inc. Put no, you didn't. where it came from. Well, you, no, you did. I didn't sing it. We won't count it. You had a wobbly chair. I did have a wobbly chair, although it seems to have stopped. Yeah, it's better now. I probably jinx it. Well, probably. Good job. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thanks for the recommendation, Shrimply. Yeah, you're um, you're the best. Thanks for um, really just allowing us to get swallowed into the uh, what's it called the the place and get out. Oh, the um, sunken place. Yes. Um, I was like, the upside down. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I was going to say. And I was like, no, that's not the right. They both work. <laughs> Get us, uh, yeah, Velcroed into the sunken place with your topic suggestions. Because the other topic suggestion you have, I haven't even started to delve in yet. Uh, but I know about it and it is dark. Yeah, Shrimply can give us the darkest recommendations. Yeah. It's almost that's like um, like if Morticia Adams wasn't um counterbalanced by gomez yeah so yeah that'll do it for us this week and uh we'll see you next thursday with something else something uh well oh, yeah we know what the sensory processing else is. <laughs> disorder <laughs> we both had a brain fart on that oh, one oh boy sorry about that so yeah next week we'll be talking about sensory processing disorder mm-hmm. and um that'll be shorter than than this one so okay so we will see you next week yeah and in the meantime you know uh fight algorithmic bias and racial bias and uh fight the man go off grid yeah wear your tinfoil hat but bring us with you charge your phone oh yeah that too yeah charge your phone (laughs) don't go so off the grid yeah (laughs) when i say off grid i just take a break Because the bars ain't high. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be here next Thursday with another episode to tangle your ear holes. In the meantime, the best way to support us is to follow us on Instagram at the bars ankle high and to subscribe and leave us a five star review on your preferred podcast streaming platform. It seems really simple, but it really is the best way to help us out, especially whenever you can actually write out a review great news we have a new merch store that ships internationally and allows you to customize your merch on an endless array of products you can head over to bit.ly slash ankle high merch to check it all out 
If you want even more ankle high hot takes in your life and have a few dollars to spare, you can also join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the bar is ankle high. There's three different tiers to choose from $2 toe rings, $5 anklets, and $10 limbo champions. Everybody gets monthly horoscopes written by yours truly. Anklets get bi weekly dysfunction junction episodes. And Limbo Champions get all of that, plus ad-free episodes. And they get added to our close friends list on Instagram. So head on over to patreon.com slash high and join today. Until next Thursday, remember to be kind to yourself because the bar is ankle high. <laughs>